This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing, and I'm your host, J. Scott. I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field enjoying God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Will Primos. Uh, for those people out there listening, uh, if they're a hunter, most everybody has heard of Primos, uh, Primos Hunting. Uh, the name Will Primos, he's a hunting icon, and uh, he's just an incredible man. I've had the fortune of meeting him on several occasions, and uh, I actually got to spend some time with him this last September on an elk hunt, and uh, nice to meet him and his uh, lovely wife, Mary, and just a fantastic person. Uh, we've got Will Primos on the line. Will, how you doing? I'm fine, Jay. Uh, am I going to have to live up to all that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, you've uh, you've pretty much uh, solidified your uh, name and reputation in the <laughs> industry, and uh, sure. uh, I just I gotta say I appreciate uh, you know as a kid watching watching videos and uh, you know getting true inspiration of hunting through uh, some of the different things that your company has provided, and and quite honestly. Uh, your personality uh, on the Truth Series videos and on the TV show and stuff. So for that, I I give you uh, give you major kudos for that. Uh, you're you're mighty kind. I, an old gentleman one time I paid him a compliment and he looked at me and he said, "Boy, I don't ever mind nobody lying to me as long as it makes me feel good." So thank you, Jay, <laughs> for making me feel good. <laughs> Sounds good, buddy. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to cover here in this episode with you uh, mainly is is your love of hunting, uh, you know, the start of your company and the creation of your company and and maybe even some of the trials and tribulations of the company. And then, uh, you know, I've got some questions here and then but I want to talk to you about elk hunting and your love of elk hunting and and, uh, you know, how all of that has uh, you know, changed over the years or has it stayed the same? And, you know, from my interpretation of spending some time with you uh, this September, you know, it, it seems the passion of hunting burns in you uh, as much as, you know, watching you early on on the video. So that was actually really nice to see that you seem to be as fired up about it now as you were as a kid, uh, Will, how did you get your start hunting, and you know what do you remember hunting first, and 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 such as a as a boy? Well, I, I was very lucky um, to be exposed to uh, a family, an extended family, aunts, uncles, daddy, um, that hunted, um, and so from the time I was, daddy doesn't know why. My daddy was a very hard working. My daddy's still living. He's 90 years old, very healthy, great guy. Mama's 88. They're just wonderful people. And I was very lucky to have such incredible, endearing parents, God fearing Christian parents who, who gave me incredible values. So I've used that all my life and still do. And, um, and I fear the Lord. I love the Lord and I want to serve him. And I, and, so we all look as as we grow up for what are we going to do for a living, you know. And I just took this passion. My daddy said early on. I started to tell you a minute ago that you know where did you get this desire for hunting? You, I was just obsessed. Um, I played uh, baseball uh, minor league. It was the only time I ever played. I played one season, and um, I was a very very aggressive catcher. And I was going to little league the next year. And uh, for minor league, and the team Mississippi Materials was the name of the team that came and approached uh, the coach and, and and said we we want Will on our team. And I said I don't believe he's going to play next year. And they said okay, well why not? I said I don't know. You have to ask him. So they came and approached me, and I told them I said I'm not playing next year. And they said well why? Is that? I said because this takes away from all my time to fish. <laughs> and, and that that's a true story and my mother tells it too she was standing there when that went on and she allowed me to make that decision she didn't tell me i had to play baseball um we don't we didn't have as many sports as the kids have today i'm 63 years old um i was born in 1952 so when that, that you know at that time around 1960 uh to 
And when I first got to be exposed to whitetail hunting, I mean, we just had a lot of opportunity um, around the house with small game, squirrels, rabbits, uh, and, and I religiously chased them. I had my own little lake there where we lived, and I had a little red, uh, red uh, uh, radio flyer red wagon. And I would fill that little, didn't have very high size, but I would fill that thing up with brim and <laughs> go home and sit down and I would clean every one of them. And they would, I, that's what I wanted for my meal. And I don't know how all that got started, but for some reason I had that desire. The first time I ever went hunting, I can actually remember it, I was probably about six. And um, my cousin Jimmy, who works with me now, at, at he came to work in the 80s uh, with me here. Now, Jimmy's 68. Uh, he'll be 68 uh, this week. But um, I, he took me hunting for a blackbird. And um, and he had this steel two fired pellet gun. It was powerful. You used a tube to screw onto it to fill up the gun. And, and so I shot me a blackbird, and I was so excited. And Jimmy said, now you're going you're gonna to eat him. You've killed him. You're going to eat him. And I said, okay. So we built a fire right there in the woods. And I breasted out the black birdie showed me how and we roasted that thing and i ate it a little rubbery i remember it being a little rubbery but it was, <laughs> but it was great <laughs> that's I, was, awesome. I was putting my own food on the table and i was all excited about it <laughs> that's a great story that's that's a fantastic story so really hunting and fishing as 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 a kid just burned a passion in your heart and 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 led to you know uh, you doing other things but uh, you know once the baseball they came for you for baseball you know yeah. you knew that it would cut into your hunting and fishing yeah well i graduated from high school in 1970 um went to the air force it was the vietnam era um very very difficult time uh for many young men the draft uh, most people today the kids today they have known nothing about the draft i think that's one of the things wrong with the country is that uh, we depend on the volunteer, you know, army, and so you knew you were going to serve in some capacity. And at that point, Vietnam was a loser, and everybody knew it. And we weren't there to win. And there were so many people getting killed. I think 54,000 total got killed. Um, and so I joined the Air National Guard, and they, I did the aptitude and that kind of thing, and. The guy came to me and said, well, here are your choices. And the second choice was a marksmanship instructor because my aptitude fit that, and they had an opening for aptitude for that uh, particular uh, job. And so I said, well, what do I do? He says, well, you'll go to uh, basic training in Lackland. You will all stay at Lackland for uh, your school, for marksmanship instructor school. And then you'll come back here, and you will maintain the range, and you will make sure all the pilots and co-pilots here know how to, to defend themselves. And you will train them to shoot M16s, uh, grenade launchers, 38 uh, revolvers, 45 caliber pistols. And part of their training, so they understand guns, is to shoot the M1 Grand. And um, so I maintained the vault, maintained all of the uh, uh guns and taught them how to shoot and it was it was it was wonderful uh you know as as i did all that and um i went on graduated from uh, a private school i started out at mississippi state no miss and i minored in biology i wanted to study forestry um but i got sidetracked chasing girls and trying to grow up and all that kind of stuff and ended up uh, staying at home. My family was in the restaurant business. So I worked in the restaurants to fuel my budget-driven passions, one of which was uh, skeet shooting. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was, as a matter of fact, in 1964, I was the junior state champion in Mississippi. And uh, this is kind of a funny story. I was the only entry in that division, so I won by default. <laughs> and won uh, by a landslide. <laughs> I won by a landslide. Uh, but I, you know, I, I worked with the family because I could, I could do, I could get my schooling done and and work hours that like their restaurants. Some of them you just they, they operated all the time. There were five of them, and we were very close, big family. There's aunts and uncles, uh, four uncles, and my daddy and my granddaddy. And anyway. And that's where I went in life to, to make a living. But I started making 
turkey calls, I uh, started selling them in 1976. Uh, and I just couldn't find what I really liked, and uh, I developed a process, and it was just kind of a hobby. But it quickly became a business, and um, it, one thing led to another, and I said, well, dead gummit, you know, I might be able to get out of the restaurant business because the restaurant business is confining. That is one heck of a retail occupation to have, especially independent restaurant tour. Um, and so and I, Will, what what were your uh, jobs uh, in the restaurant business? I mean, were you everything from a dishwasher to what, oh, you, what, what yeah. actually were you doing? Yes, that's part of the work ethic. You did it all because who who knows who's not going to come to work that day. But um, we opened and closed. There was the primos that opened and closed every restaurant and controlled the cash receipts and making the deposits. And, and so you worked doing that, but you, you, if you, uh, you got too busy and the staff couldn't handle it. You waited on tables. Uh, if you needed to assist the staff in expediting and getting the – Dishes off the off the line and out to the tables. You did that. Uh, if the hostess was sick that day, you hosted. So if you needed to mop the floor, you mop the floor. If you need to clean the toilet, you clean the toilet. I mean, and that's part of the work ethic. And I think that's what I was taught by my family. And I wasn't above doing anything, and still am not. Um, and I, I just I love people. I love seeing people be successful. As I got into the call business, you know, the the, the big first big success that really saw this, this thing might have some light at the end of the tunnel was an audio tape. There, was, there were no CDs. There were no DVDs. It was audio or VHSs weren't even born yet. Um, and I did an audio tape and explained how to use a turkey call and I actually recorded live hunts in the woods. And that thing was a huge success. It helped us sell more calls. And the next step in 1986 was video. And... Um, it's all, it was a timing issue. If, if video hadn't come along, I could have never promoted the company the way I did. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, and, and I wanted things done a certain way, and it took a long time. But by 1990, we had over 100 employees, and we're growing like crazy. That's fantastic. Uh, Will, doubling back to something you had said about, uh, you know, working a family business, uh you know, pretty much doing every job, you know, what can a new business owner and or the younger generation today learn from the mentality of, you know, don't quit your day job and continue doing what you're doing. And, but doesn't that force you to work 24 seven? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that yeah, mentality I, and, and why that's yeah, uh, allowed I'll, I'll, you to succeed? I can. I'll take that a step further because I recently had to give it a speech, and, and this became part of my speech because I was speaking to a lot of graduating kids moving uh, from college into the workplace, and, and some high school people too, but mainly they were business people and, and college kids that were fixing to be graduating. And, you know, I've met many kids, you know, I said, well, uh, have you finished school? Yeah, I finished school. Uh, so if you, you got a job, you work. No, I haven't found, haven't found what I want to do. I just, I just don't know really what I'm passionate about. Oh, okay. Well, um, how are you paying your bills? Well, I'm still living with mom and daddy, and they're still having there. And that really disturbs me. And I got kicked out. I mean, there was, I mean, I was given a, 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 a guidelines and said, okay, here's the window. So, if you don't get this done by this date, you're on your own. And so I had very strict uh, upbringing, but it made a man out of me at, a, at an earlier age. And one of the things that I realized was that I had to make a living. So when I got back from the Air Force, went back to my, got to college, got my college education, finally graduated in 1974, um, I, I was fixing to get out of school. And I really wanted to hunt for a living. And that, how do you do that? And does that pay the bills? <laughs> so I went to work for my, my family, and I ended up – we had one restaurant that was absolutely huge. We had I don't know how many, over over 125 employees during the peak um, Christmas season and stuff like that. But we had 13 banquet rooms. It was the only facility that didn't have a hotel and associated with it that had banquet facilities. So we entertained the Kiwanis Club and our uh, – the uh, – uh, Rotary Club and a lot of other organizations who met on a regular basis, and then we'd we'd have dances for the, the Calliope Club. It's an older group of people in Jackson, Mississippi, that had a big dance once a year and stuff like that. Well, I really didn't want to do that, uh, but yet I was taught no matter what you do, 
if it's digging a ditch or whatever you do, you dig the de- best ditch. And if you agree to work for a certain wage, whether you like the uh, salary, the wage or not, if you agree to do it, then you owe it to do it the right way and to do it the best of your ability. And you you also anticipate problems. So when you're doing something, don't take a shortcut because it's just going to give a problem to somebody else down the road. So I remembered all those things. But what happened was I did those things not really wanting to do them, but I did them because that was my job, and I, I took it seriously. But I began to meet people that I would have never met otherwise because – I'd been in school, been, been doing all that kind of thing, but here I was meeting the business leaders in this area, and they opened doors for me. One man was the biggest industrialist in the southeast, a man named Warren Hood. He was eating dinner with his wife on a Saturday one day, and I was waiting on tables because we were short of help. And I've known Mr. Hood, went to school with his children, with his at the same age as me, so I've known who he was and what he was. But he had 18,000 acres of Mississippi rolling pine and hardwoods in south of Jackson. And he says, look, I'm covered up with turkeys. You come hunt. Come hunt with me. Come hunt any time you want. And that's where I did my recordings. And then we'd ride around, and he'd tell me stories about his business endeavors. He started over 50 companies, extremely, extremely successful. And so these these openings, another man was Bill Walker. Um that opened his his door to me, and they gave me opportunity I would have never had any other way. So my message to the young people is, no matter what, pay your way, get a job, and it will open the door that you never would have been able to see was open for you by what you did, by who you met, by opportunity that you didn't know was going to be there. So if you sit around waiting for this passion to come up, it may not come till later in life. Uh, my daddy, he he was he worked his fanny off. He didn't retire until he was 76. And he raised three boys, sent them to college, took care of his family. He's a Depression child. He's a World War II vet. And he's part of that, that generation that is so great. But he taught me that I was going to have to make decisions, and the decisions I made were going to be so important. I love the Jeremiah Johnson movie that was put out in 1972, was directed by Sidney Pollack. Uh, stars Robert Redford is a story about a mountain man. You know the story, yeah. um, and it, it is it, 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 it's fiction, but it's it's built on some lore and some nonfiction of the mountain man history. But there's a song that repeats itself throughout the theme of the music, and the song's words are: "The way that you wonder is the way that you choose." The day that you tarry is the day that you lose. Sunshine or thunder, a man will always wonder. So it's just a wonderful, a wonderful, you know, message that even other people have gotten. But doing nothing is not the answer. Do something, even if it's not what you think you want to do. Yeah, I mean that's an incredible point to 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 make that even in in a situation where. You know, people think they're in a dead end if they change their attitude and realize that the opportunities might be right in front of them uh, and that they need to seize those opportunities, uh, all, although it might not be the, the way they think that it's going to go down, you know, some of the best opportunities might be staring them right in the face. With that being said, Will, you talk about uh, you did some of your first recordings uh, talk about some of, you know, what was your intention on getting those recordings? Did you want to, A, get the very best sound that you could, or was it more uh, was it more from an entertainment standpoint as far as trying to sell the calls, or was it more from a standpoint of wanting to be precise and get the exact sounds of those turkeys? It was all the above that you just said. Um, first off, you wanted it to be accurate. But I kept going to to I'd, be, I'd make calls and then I'd go to an outdoor show and I'd have a little ten foot booth and I'd put my little calls on a card table and I'd sit there with a little sign that said Primos and I would talk to people and they would go look you know I've got turkeys on my land but what, what do I do what, what, how do I go about it and so I began to see that people who didn't have a mentor didn't have an uncle or somebody to teach them um, I had a man named Buck Dearman who was a friend of my uncle's 
who knew the most about turkey hunting, he took me under his wing, and so he went and sat with me. And so I'd sit there with that lynch box call, and he'd say, okay, wait a minute. He's still on the limb. Wait. Then fly down. When you think he's on the ground, well, listen for his gobble. It'll sound different on the ground. And when he gobbles on the ground, he's ready. Now, let him know you're here. Just cluck and yelp at him. Don't be too – just take his temperature. And so old Buck taught me how to take a turkey's temperature and, and, and gave him the scenario. So when people would walk up to me, I realized, you know, that's the same for everybody else. So the, the goal of my recordings was to let people actually hear the sounds I was making and the response of the gobbler. And I would narrate it, try to. And I hired the best sound guy that I could find in this area. And he used what at that time was called a Swedish Nagra, N-A-G-R-A recorder, is the way I remember it. And it was reel to reel. And the reels were bigger than the surface they, they spun on. So he would have to open it up, take out the reels, and he's making a little noise and putting them in place. So it was very difficult. I thought I'd go out the first day, you know. I'm Will Prince. Yeah. I, can, I can kill a turkey anytime I want. I mean, I think it took us all season to finally get one hunt. It was ridiculous. It, 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 you added these other elements that make it hard to move, hard hard to make the plays you need to make, and getting the sound and everything. It was very difficult. And as soon as I had that, I went to the studio, and I got lucky. Um, uh, there was a guy, Wolf Stevenson, that I'd known. I had met him when I was 16 years old at a, at a dance in Jackson. And um, I remembered him, and he owned Malico Recording Studios. And they recorded all the blues and soul of all the Southern artists. Um, and so I, I went to him and I said, look, I, can I hire you to put this tape? Yeah, we can do it after hours. I won't charge you. And this guy was like, you've got to be kidding me. I said, I won't pay you something. <laughs> uh, take me to dinner. So the studio would close down sometimes 9, 10 o'clock when the artists would quit doing their deal because they like to work late at night. And we'd work till 2 and 3 in the morning. And – Back then, it wasn't digital. It was all on tape. And you, you've heard some. Of you might have heard the, the expression, "Well, that'll hit the that'll hit the edit floor." Well, mm -hmm. they were actually taking the tape with a razor blade and locating the ah. So he took out every time I said ah, and I would probably a thousand of them because I didn't know what I was going to say. The next word I was going ah ah ah. So he'd he'd take his hands and he'd he'd roll the the, the disc back and forth and go ah oh, ah oh, oh, and he'd find it and then he would take a razor blade and cut it out and tape the back of it. It was incredible. So that was the edit process. That is unbelievable. It is. And, and 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 Will, at that point in time, I mean, it wasn't like you had a bunch of money. I mean, you were putting everything you had into this deal and. Uh, there were probably some that – were there some that looked at you and said, you're going to do what? And and did you take that as fuel to fire and just knew that you were going to follow your passion and knew that you wanted what you wanted to do and, and you you didn't let the distraction get to you? Talk about a little bit about well, that. Well, you know, some of that is true. Um, first off, I'm a realist. Um, I'm going to look at reality. I might have a, a, a desire and a dream, and I'm going to, as long as nothing stops me cold from trying to reach that dream, I'm going to try. So, yes, people said, you're going to do what? And I remember one guy told me, he says, number one, Olt, O-L-T, Olt's got the waterfowl market tied up. Ben Lee and Quaker Boy, and they were, they were blowing and going back then. They weren't as big as they became, and then we passed them later, but... They were everything. Loman was everything back then. And I said, yeah, but they're not doing it this way, and I think I have a better idea. But here's the deal. I didn't quit my day job. I, yeah. I, I, I hired um, a guy going to school, and he got out of school every day at 12 o'clock, and he would come over. I had a recording uh, machine set up, take the orders. I was advertising in Turkey Call magazine. That, that Turkey Call started in 1975 in WTF, and they had a little – the little, I mean, just a little one inch by half inch little ad, you know, Primo's Yelpers for sale, you know, call or write. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. You didn't even know what I was doing. I, and I learned. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I did not quit my day job. And I, I think finally in 1988 when I quit the day job and went full time, I didn't draw a salary. 
I know this for a fact. I didn't draw a salary for 10 years. My wife, wow. support, my wife supported me. And up until that point, I, I think when I quit in 88, I had like 26 employees. And I had, I had them working at my house. I couldn't afford at that point. I didn't have enough momentum built up, so I couldn't afford to go spend a bunch of money on rent every month. So I converted the living room, the garage, every aspect of my house was one part of the business. I'd even hired a head of marketing back then, and I had him take over the living room. And that's where everybody came to work. And I think what, that's – That's what you Will. do. That's just what you do. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely, a, you know, entrepreneur's – American, you know, that's just how, that's just how you do it. And that is an unbelievable story. And I think it, you know, it show it shows your work ethic. I think it shows your commitment to the company and commitment to the belief that you had in yourself and in the company. And, you know, it sounds like it was an all in deal. While you didn't quit your day job, you were fully invested in this, this, you know, your way of the future and, and your idea that, you know, there was nobody going to talk you out of that. And I think that's a huge, uh, important thing for people to remember is uh, once you get started down your path, you know, it's going to be bumpy along the way. But, you know, you just you keep plowing forward if you believe in your dream. Yeah, well, there, there's a lot of sacrifices uh, to make. And I never got that big, huge sledgehammer in the forehead brick wall that said this is over i kept getting little encouragements um some of the biggest encouragements for me were people that said hey i can't believe how that turkey responded i can't believe how that deer responded you know i got to a point and i forget the date it was somewhere in the 80 middle 80s or somewhere around there i wanted to go and learn about elk. I didn't know nothing about elk. I, I you know, I'd, I'd been seen elk and seen new deer at Estes Park, and when I was in 1967, I went and took a little vacation there with my family, and I knew I'd come back to be a part of that because I was, I, I hiked up uh, and fished in a little beaver pond and caught cutthroats, and I just was just enthralled by that at 15 years old. Well, I went and got uh, these two guys who had killed the number one and two world record elk they were both from your state of arizona and they were the elmer jay and jeff elmer yeah you remember them yeah absolutely absolutely from cottonwood i believe yeah i flew them to jackson mississippi took them into my house and we sat down and i said i know nothing about elk i want to pay you a royalty help me design elk calls well little did i know they really didn't know that much about calling. They were good, and they knew some, I mean, a ton more than I did, but they had killed the elk on water holes and, and had located these big monster elk, you know. And sometimes the bigger elk are a lot harder to call unless you catch them just right. Um, but anyway, they were a great part of that, and, and then that didn't work well uh, for them or us, and so it went away. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it myself. So I started going out west and staying a month, and the first, first time I went with 88. And I started staying a month and watching everything transform from early September when nothing was really happening as the, as the bugling time grew and trying to understand public ground and, and all the things it took to understand elk in different parts of the West. And finally one day, uh, kill one, and we finally figured it out that if you're going to run a camera and you're going to call elk, they're going to come into you and you're standing there calling, and the camera's close enough to see you, they come in there, and they usually stop about 75 yards and depending on the terrain, and they stand there and look. They see the elk uh, that's calling to them, be it a bull or a cow, or they make their, they stay high on a, on a bull because they don't want to get in a fight and not be having an advantage. And we realized we needed to take their attention totally away from us. So, so I'll call until a certain point, and there's a caller behind us, and that, is what turned it around. We've killed over 200 elk on video and shared it with the elk hunting world uh, all these years. I forget how many it is now, but it's, it's well over 200. And we, we we do that, and the number one thing that'll that'll really make you make it more make it better for you is to have a caller behind you, 75 to 100, 150 yards. 
and it 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 totally changes the whole surprise deal on elk. That's awesome, and and so early on, once once you finally killed an elk, you you figured out that uh, having someone behind you was a key. To this day, uh, I see on your videos um, that's a huge tactic that you guys use. Um, I think people can learn if they, you know, if they have a buddy with them, you know, the fade away tactic as well. I like where the caller that's behind you may actually kind of just ease back once he's, you know, the elk, yes. you know, you've gotten that, the elk's that, attention. That. They ease away and the elk thinks that they're leaving. Yes. And, yes. you know, it, yeah, exactly. You hit on, hit on a, a perfect topic there. What do you think it is in the elk senses that, you know, doesn't want to bring them to five yards, even though a lot of your videos are close by. What is it that you think it's just them being wary uh, of the call uh, because it's not 100% perfect, or do you think it's just in their nature? Well, I think, every you know, every once in a while you'll have one that's just crazy, and he's usually a, a, a satellite bull that's just so worked up, and he just, he'll run you over no matter what. Um, but generally the bigger bulls or the bigger satellites, they're, they're used to, um, approaching other elk and they sometimes bulls are silent and I think it is a defensive measure on the elk's part because if he if he runs charging up in there and does not figure out what's going on he can get slammed from the side and he, he can easily get hurt by another elk and so he wants to size it up and know what's going on so when he, he gets to the point that always before he's been able to see the elk that's doing the calling and see what's going on He'll stop and look, yeah. and so it's that seventy-five yard deal. I had a, had a guy call for me one year. Uh, got a hunt on a real nice place, and this guy went with me, and he was going to be our caller. And okay, so he kept he wouldn't get more than about twenty twenty-five yards away. And I said, "Look, here's the deal, sir. I, I don't want to tell you. You've been calling elk a long time. You know what you're doing. But here's the deal: if you can see me, you're too close, mm -hmm. because that's the biggest mistake." most people make they want to see they want to be a part well if you want to right. be a part you better back up because ain't nothing going to be a part of if you don't back up <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 and will what is it about archery elk hunting i know you like to rifle hunt and muzzleloader and and but i know you have a, a true passion for archery elk hunting uh Talk to me a little bit about that love of of the archery, and is it the close encounter? Or what is it that uh, that that you know you really like about archery elk hunting? Yeah, it really is the close encounter um, about being able to see them being themselves and going through their mating ritual and being that close. Um, I killed a elk, the first elk I ever killed with a gun. I killed in 2003, and it was a Harper's. Very, uh, reproduction flintlock that was the gun that Lewis and Clark were said to have taken on the core of discovery. And I had wow. it co commissioned and built, learned to shoot it, and, um, and shot a, a beautiful elk with it. And that was the first one. I shot him at 11 yards. Um, and just to finish that story real quickly, about uh, three months after that, sometime in the early 2004, somebody found some documents that showed that that gun was not the gun that Lewis and Clark took on the expedition, that they had been commissioned and they had been ordered uh, by Jefferson by the money that he gave the guys to get ready for the expedition, but they didn't, were not able to get the guns built in time. So that was not the gun that they took. But I was there in spirit with the gun I thought they took. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the next uh, elk that I killed, I didn't kill one with a, uh, with a, with a gun for many years until, uh, what is this, 2000, that year was 14, so probably the year 2000, uh, somewhere around in there. I, had, I, was, I loved the history of the, uh, the Shiloh uh, Sharps gun, Sharps. Um, and the 4570, and and the, you know the the other gun calibers that they shot buffalo with back then. So I got one of those guns. It was a shallow shot reproduction made in Big Timber, Montana. And uh, I, I took that gun on a hunt, 
and in, in southern Colorado and killed an elk with it at, at 275 yards. It was a fun hunt. The scope, I had a period scope built by Montana Vintage Arms uh, Company in Belgrade, Montana. The scope's, you know, it's not more than an inch in diameter, and it's 28 inches long. Um, and it's an old uh, six-power scope. Uh, just and actually, the scope actually, when you shoot it, it's on rails and it goes forward, so it won't hit you in the eye because there's not enough eye release, and the gun wow. kick, kicks back. So you actually return the scope to its original position every time. And the gun, which really the first sniper gun, um, at 100 yards, I can shoot a hole in a piece of paper, and the next shot I can touch that hole at 100 yards with a bench rest with that gun. It's wow. incredibly accurate. Anyway, so I killed that, that elk with a gun. And then uh, my company was acquired and purchased as part of a, a larger conglomerate of brands, 30-something brands, one of which is Savage Arms, which I'd never shot a Savage. Um, and so I got a Savage and, and went hunting with a Savage uh, two years ago. I uh, used a 308. Um, I love the triggers on those guns. They're incredible. Uh, and it's kind of cool. You shoot you shoot an elk with one of them things, and they fall down right there. You don't have to go track them down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then last year, I killed one with a 300 uh, at 225 yards. And, and you know, it, it was a neat experience, but I love the bow hunting. Uh, I shoot a Matthews, yeah. and, and I just love bow hunting. I love being up close. Um, but the, the bow hunting, there's so much more to it, um, the physical part, the time of year part watching the fall hit the Rockies, the Aspens change, and just enjoying that part of God's creation. It's just overwhelming uh, to, to see all that. Uh, so I go back to the beginning we were talking. I feel so lucky to have been exposed to wildlife and the places that they call home at an early age. And as I grew up and began to see how much habitat was the answer? It's one reason I love the National Wild Turkey Federation so, so much. Yeah. As they realized that they had fulfilled their mission, which was turkeys everywhere, they re, they looked at it and they go, wait a minute. We really need to examine this. What is our mission now that we've fulfilled our mission? And the mission is save the habitat, save the hunt, because everybody yeah. wants to take away our hunting rights, and you don't have anything to hunt if you don't have habitat. And I just I love the people in Arizona who go out and build water tanks and take care of elk and provide the, the habitat that they need to thrive. So I call it the places that wildlife call home. So I, I I love I love being a part of that. Yeah, and you can tell in your videos. Uh, I just watched the latest uh, Primos uh, Truth the Elk video, and it was fantastic. One of the things that always uh, amazes me with you, Will, is on every video, it seems as though you're able to capture the emotion. Uh, and, and knowing you personally, I mean, I, you know, and being around you, that is the guy you are. Can you speak a little bit about some of the times on these videos when, you know, you can tell that the emotion of the situation uh, or the realness of the situation almost takes you know, takes over you and, you know, you just go into your, you know, appreciation. Talk to me about the realism of, of what you feel in your heart when that moment hits. Well, you know, hunting with a camera person who's running the camera, I've always wanted the camera got to be a part of the hunt. Um, I don't, they're not a fly on the wall. They're, they're actually there. They're helping in the process. Um, so you're becoming a family um, of friends. My wife gets to go on one elk hunt with me a year. I usually go on two or three a year, and she goes on one, and she's called up the last uh, 17 elk that I've killed. And to be there with her, to have her see and be a part of it, um, she says uh, it ain't hard to call up an elk that it, you know, all women should be able to do it because they know exactly what a man's thinking. <laughs> so so uh, may, that may be true. There's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> there, there's probably is a lot of truth to that. But w one time we were, uh, I, I, I was standing there and I went, oh my gosh, there's a bunch of elk behind me. And, you know, probably 50 yards behind me, I could hear feet, I could hear rocks rolling, and, you know, I'm going, oh my gosh. And so 
I, I just froze, and I had quit calling the elk that way out there. I, I usually call when they get within 150 yards, but he never got that close, and I just shut up because I didn't want to get the elk all over on top of me. I wanted where Mary was, and so I hunched over and we're talking. I said, did you hear all those elk behind me? Uh, did you see them? She goes, that was me. I says, what were you doing? <laughs> She says, well, I picked up rocks and acted like elk walking and started, you know, just acting like elk, me and elk. I said, well, how'd you learn that? It says, I watch it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's you know, the, the, when the motion, when the, the time does hit, I am an emotional person, but I've learned to just forget about the camera. Um, and for the most part, there are moments when you do remember it, but for the most part, I just, and, and I tell the camera guy, Either you're running the camera and you get it, but I'm not redoing it. If you, you catch me in an, an emotional moment and I allow you to share that with the public, that's fine. But I'm not, I can't redo it. Yeah. You know, I'm not, a, I'm, this isn't Hollywood. And that's one of the primo trademarks. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the primo trademarks is this ain't Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and it's not. I remember one time I killed a whitetail. It was a big moment. It was a big white tail, and I was so it just 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 to be there. And I'm with this person in the tree, and um, so I just turned to him and I said, "Can you just turn that off a minute?" And he turns the camera off and looks at me like, "What do I do?" I said, "Just let me be alone for a minute." And I climbed down and I went and found that white tail on my own, because that's what we got to do. That's what you, Jay, and Will got to do before we were followed around with cameras. We were yeah. just enjoying God's creation, enjoying this moment of putting food on the table and the respect you had for all of this. And, um, you know, we're seeing all kinds of wildlife in addition to the game that we're after. But we wouldn't see it any other way if we didn't go there and do it. And the same thing for waterfowl hunting and the green timber and, and the beautiful grass, flooded grass areas of Mississippi, uh, and same thing for whitetail hunting. Same, same thing for all of it, for turkey hunting. Um, it, it's just a time you get to get out there and slow down and, and take a breath of the fresh air. I call them little greens, but right now it's fixing to start, spring's fixing to come again, and all the little greens are going to bud out, and life is going to be renewed, and God's plan is going to be fulfilled, and uh, the mating ritual of the wild turkey, you know, all the songbirds are going to go on. And just just a minute ago, while we were talking, I was looking out my window, and there was a bluebird out there. And I love y'all's western bluebirds. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but our bluebird, the eastern bluebird, is so beautiful. And yeah. if you if you don't appreciate it and and are a part of protect are not a part of protecting that, um, then I think you need to reexamine the reason you're doing it. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has a great mission and is, a, is doing a great job. The New Deer Foundation, National Wild Turkey Federation, Ducks Unlimited, all of those organizations are important to the future of hunting. Uh, and if we don't recognize that and don't fight for it, we could lose it. Because when you, when you, as Thomas Jefferson said, when you get as urban as Europe, you will become as corrupt as Europe. And it's happening to us. I mean, Absolutely. people are taking away our trapping rights, and they they vote without ever having to understand the world that's out there. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that's that's awesome stuff, Will. I, you couldn't have nailed it on, you know, hit the nail on the head any any sharper uh, with those last statements for sure. Um, man, I want to appreciate. Uh, I want to let you know how much I appreciate you being with us. And uh, in conclusion, I'd like to talk to you about the 2015 turkey season and what you've got as far as a forecast uh in mississippi and are you going to be hunting some other places give me a little rundown on what you have in front of you and maybe some of the conditions uh is it droughty or is it uh you know has it been a a cold winter what's going on down there uh we've had a great winter Uh, mississippi's winters uh, are dependent on the, the strength of the highs and lows. The lows coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. We're about three and a half hours from the coast. Um, so that, that, that affects us, and that creates the moisture. That's why Mississippi has a high rainfall. I want to say our average rainfall across the state is over 60 inches. Um, so we've had, we're having a wet uh, spring right now. Um, the season will be great in some areas and not so good in some areas, but overall it will be wonderful. Um, we had a, a decent hatch last year. Um, last year, I didn't go anywhere outside the state. This year, 
uh, I'm going to hunt here at home. I'm going to hunt uh, uh, some other places around here that, 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 that you know. And it's always fun to hunt places that you know because when he gobbles, you go, hmm, he's on the other side of that creek. I better cross the creek. I mean, those are sure. those are good things that, that, to know. They help you make it easy for the gobbler to come to you. Um, but I'm going to go to southern Colorado in May. Uh, I'm oh, gonna good. Hunt, I'm going to hunt New Mexico, too. Um, I just I, – I, the, the Miriams of the West are beautiful. I had one uh, in in uh, northern New Mexico, right below Wheeler Peak. I killed him at 10,500 feet, and he was with a Jake, and um, we hunted him and hunted him and hunted him. He was, he was a very hard-headed gobbler. Sometimes, somebody says Miriams are stupid. They're nuts. They can be very smart. <laughs> but I named this turkey Poncho, and his buddy was Lefty. And so we were after Poncho and Lefty, and the fifth day we finally killed him, and k- killed uh, uh, Poncho. And he was a, a trophy, uh, trophy, trophy near him. Um, but I look forward to seeing that. When I shot that turkey, Poncho, there was snow in the background on the north side of the hill there, and uh, it hadn't, hadn't uh, thawed out yet, hadn't melted. Um, so I look forward to being in, in your part of the world this, this, uh, awesome. this spring. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best. And uh, when does your season start here in Mississippi? What day does it start this year? It starts Monday, the 16th. Okay. Okay. So and you're, you're just see, about... You, yeah, youth season was this past weekend. You, you okay. Weekend. Mm-hmm. Good. Good. Well, Which you're going to be... It's a little early. I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a late, lingering winter. We've had uh, we've had a good winter, you know. Um, and, and, you know, our winters, it might stay below freezing for two days, three days, but it generally, if you have a, a 20 degree morning it's going to get up to 40 or 45 that day so we don't we don't have the winters like they have in the northeast and you know some parts sure. of the west you know that doesn't stay sure. frozen sure well i wish you the best uh there in mississippi and on your adventures out west and it was great to see you in nashville at the nwtf and uh uh, also, thank you for that box call. Uh, you sent me a box cutter uh, after the elk hunt. Uh, yeah, I'll cherish yeah. that forever. You signed it, and uh, that's gonna. I'm gonna use it, but it's uh, it's always gonna go uh, in a special place for well, me. And uh, you see, when I, I, I wanna... when, when I sent it to you, it's probably worth fifty bucks. But when I signed it, the value was lowered to five. <laughs> a depreciating asset huh? exactly exactly <laughs> uh not not in my book uh i just want to tell you how much uh i appreciate you coming on here and talking with us and wish you the best on your turkey hunts and your elk hunts next year and uh, god bless you and uh, thanks for doing all that you've done for our hunting heritage and um tell tell miss mary hello it was great to get to know her uh last september and and uh, we'll be chatting at you, and, and uh, just have a great season, and and uh, we'll be we'll be talking at you. Well, thank you. Take care. And uh, you going after the ghouls this year? Yep, we're gonna do. Uh, I start every year in California with my nephews for Rio Grande, and then we've got some Arizona Merriam's hunts here, and then I'll finish up uh, two weeks in Mexico uh, guiding Goulds turkey hunters the first through the fifteenth. So. Should be another fantastic year, and um, have to get you down sometime to hunt a Gould uh, if you haven't already got one. Yeah, my luck, I'll end up in some Mexican jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better brush up on your Spanish then. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have a lot of brushing up to do. <laughs> Sounds oh, man. good, Mr. Will. We'll take you, take care, and uh, congrats with all your successes, and we look forward to seeing more videos and uh, keep up the good work. You're mighty kind. Thank you, Jake. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow, that was awesome, getting to spend some good quality time with Mr. Will Primos of Primos Hunting Calls. Uh, I've been a big admirer of Will's for many years, and it was uh, just awesome to have him on the show. I want to thank our listeners um, for supporting us and giving us good ratings on iTunes. And uh, if you have some feedback and comments, uh, please put them on iTunes. And if you have any questions... Uh, or comments of the show and you'd like to contact me directly, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can follow our progress on our upcoming turkey hunts and such that we have going on across the West at jscottoutdoors.com. On our Facebook page at jscottoutdoors, we have a YouTube channel, jscottoutdoors, and Instagram, uh, jscottoutdoors, and then my associate, Dark Colburn, 
is Dar, D-A-R-R, Colburn, C-O-L-B-U-R-N. Follow us on Instagram. And I just want to, again, thank our listeners for tuning in. And I had mentioned in the show that uh, Will Primos had given me a turkey call after uh, spending some time with him on an elk hunt in September in Montana. And uh, he actually signed it. It's a Primos box cutter, single-sided box. And I just wanted to um, give you a little demonstration. It's a real nice, sweet sound and call. So I'll, I'll run it here for you. real easy to use um uh you can actually you know cluck with it and um it's 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 just a nice sound and call That ought to make them gobble. Uh, thanks uh, to Mr. Will for sending that to me. I'm going to use it this spring on some turkeys. And uh, thanks to our listeners. And until next time, God bless. <laughs>